Um, so thank you so much for doing this. We, I, we, we've had a, a podcast conversation before, but doing it in real life is about a thousand times better. Um, this is a book that has got an embarrassment of praise, um, and I, I, our agreement is that you're going to sort of kick off and give the kind of overview and synopsis with some cool slides, and then we're going to have a conversation, and then we're going to take your questions. So um, why don't you kick off? Well, thank you very much indeed. I should say it is great to be back in London. I haven't been here for quite a long time. It's even better to be back here at an event in person. Goodbye, Zoom. And it's great to be here in the new Conduit Club because, boy, is it trendy. Um, when I got here, I said to Paul, do I need to change? Because I was actually planning to change into a dress. And he looked me up and down and said, absolutely not. <laughs> Hooray. Um, but anyway, I'm here. I'm delighted to have a chance to do this with you guys. Um, let me come over to the side so I won't get in the way of the slides. But um, basically, as many of you know, I've spent the last um, almost three decades working with the Financial Times, talking to people who pretend to be grown-ups in the world of business, finance, policy making, government, etc., etc. Um, my current job is that I chair the editorial board of the FT for the US. Um, previously, I ran the news operations in North America, I ran the financial coverage, ran Lex once, etc., etc. So I spent years swimming in the world of CEOs, financial markets, and politicians. But I have a dirty secret, which is that before I became a journalist, I was actually trained as a cultural anthropologist. And I spent many, many years with grown-ups when they find out about my weird background, looking at me and saying, what? Why don't you have a degree in economics or an MBA or astrophysics? How on earth does your training equip you to write about my life, about the city of London, Wall Street, Washington, etc.? Um, after that, they've often said, and I've got a kid who says they want to go to college and study anthropology instead of accounting. I'm really worried. Will they ever get a job? <laughs> so I wrote this book to try and explain to people that yes, with a background in anthropology, you will get a job. In fact, I am passionately convinced is one of the skills that's really needed today as we try to build back better, think about how to build a better world, think about how to cope with the world drowning in artificial intelligence, technology, etc., etc. I really think that cultural anthropology is one of the least recognized tools we need today. Um, but I also wrote this book to simply explain how and why it's informed me as a journalist in what I do. To give you a sense of, and, and also I should add, not just why it's informed me as a journalist, but why I think it can be incredibly valuable for people who work in finance, economics, business, law, tech, medicine, almost any area of life, and also why I think it's badly misunderstood. But to start off with a few pictures, um, and just explain where I, I'm coming from, um, I, this is me many, many years ago. Um, you're supposed to say, I haven't changed. <laughs> but anyway, I, <laughs> I started my life off as um, an anthropologist. I, in fact, originally got into it because I had a gap year back in the days when teenagers still had gap years. These days they don't seem to because everyone's so insecure and anxious. But I had a gap year, spent a year working in Pakistan, subsequently spent a lot of time in Tibet doing academic research, and then went and did a PhD in cultural anthropology based in Tajikistan. Anyone here been to Tajikistan? Amazing, that's more than most people when I do these talks. Um, I, don't, I won't ask how many of you can locate it on a map or can spell its capital city. But when I was there, it was the last year of the Soviet Union. It's just north of Afghanistan. It's basically very similar to Afghan culture, except they don't wear black veils. The women wear outfits like this. And I did a classic anthropological experience of living in a high mountain village for a year and a half with a Tajik family. That was part of the family. Can you show the next, next slide? Um, living with them as one of the community, um, and trying to understand what made them tick, what made them live life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, you can see me there. Um, and the next picture, that's it. 
My technical, um, the area I was studying in my anthropology research was marriage rituals and the way that marriage rituals and marriage practices reflected how the Tajiks were navigating their, the fact that they were Islamic, Muslim, but they lived in the Soviet communist system. And I went there to try and study how they did or did not navigate what I assumed wrongly was a massive clash between the two systems. Um, this is fairly classic old-style anthropology research. Um, anthropology really started out as a discipline devoted to immersing yourself in the lives of people who seem strange to you, weird, often on the other side of the world, to try and understand the human condition and get a broader view of what makes humans tick. Um, back in the 19th century, they tended to look at people who were subjects in the British Empire. They've since expanded, or rather in the 20th century, they expanded the idea of what they viewed as strange and different. But the idea was to go and immerse yourself, as I did, in the lives and minds of people who seem different, with an open mind and a desire to learn about a different way of looking at the world and understanding their mental map or how they organize the world in their minds. So that's what I did as my um, research work in academia. And then there was a very, very brutal civil war that erupted after the Soviet Union broke up and Tajikistan was forced into independence. And the community I worked in, um, like much of the area, was caught up in the war. Many terrible things happened. And I ended up becoming a journalist initially because I wanted to write about it for human rights reasons. Um, Tajikistan has a ghastly distinction of being the only country where things got so bad that people fled into Afghanistan. Everyone else is trying to get out of Afghanistan. In Tajikistan, they went into Afghanistan. Anyway, so I became a journalist. I spent a um, couple of years of my life covering lots of small wars around the Soviet Union, joined the FT, and was then trained up in economics and finance. Um, I realized along the way that actually, if you want to understand how the world works, it's not enough to just look at culture, you need to understand how money goes around the world. And if you can combine those two perspectives, then you really have a good way to understand what drives the world. But anyway, so I then moved, move into the next slide, into a very different tribal group, <laughs> what I call the Davos tribe. Here is a picture of me wearing the uniform of the Davos tribe. Um, at Davos, in fact, with Chelsea Clinton and um, Jamie Dimon and others, um, up on television in a classic part of the Davos rituals, appearing on TV shows, and then down below more recently in a Zoom conference with all the great and the good of the central banking world, like Jay Powell and Christine Lagarde and Yi Gan and people like that. Last slide. Yeah, another shot of the Davos tribe out playing in the rituals with Sheryl Sandberg. And to really cut the chase, and that's the end of the slides, the key thing I'm trying to say and we'll talk about it more in conversation with Paul, is that when people say to me, okay, so you have this background studying Tajik wedding rituals, how and why did that help you to do your job as a journalist? What I say is actually, we're all tribal at the end of the day. We're all shaped by rituals and symbols that we often don't think about, but are really fundamental to the kind of mental map we have of the world. We're all deeply influenced by cultural assumptions that we don't even think about, that we inherit from our surroundings. And that applies whether you're in Tajikistan or in Davos, in the city of London, in Wall Street, Washington, wherever. And the power of anthropology, and in some ways it sort of is reflected in my own weird life journey, is that by immersing yourself in the minds and lives of people who seem a bit different to you, or very different from, to you, like in Tajikistan, you don't just get empathy for another point of view and appreciate the spectrum of cultural difference that both unites us and binds us together as humans, which, by the way, is incredibly important to get empathy for another point of view in a world that's both very polarized and very tightly bound together as a single global system. You know, we have this ghastly paradox today that we're so tightly bound as a single global system that we're constantly exposed to contagion not just medical contagion, but economic contagion, financial contagion, political contagion, and yet we don't have contagion of understanding of each other. So we're constantly shocked by things coming from nowhere. So understanding other people 
Having empathy for difference is crucial in this modern world, but it has a second win-win, and that's what I'm going to talk about with Paul, which is that the very act of immersing yourself in a different life like Tajikistan or like people down the end of the road who come from a different political party doesn't just make you understand others, it also makes you understand yourself. Because the Chinese have this amazing proverb, which is that a fish can't see water. None of us can see the assumptions that shape us unless we jump out of our fishbowl, even for a moment, swim in other water, go talk to different fish, and look back at ourselves. And that gives us clarity, not just about the things we like to talk about every day, but most importantly of all, about the social silences in our lives, the stuff we ignore, the stuff we can't see unless we jump out of our water. And it's that goal of trying to see our water, trying to see social silences, trying to have lateral vision in a world dominated by tunnel vision that I think, above all else, is something we need to seek for as we try and build back better right now. But that's the end of me talking, because I'm supposed to, I've only talked in five minutes. Apologies, Paul. And now you can grill me. <laughs> so those sorts of intros are always devilishly difficult for people who are going to conduct conversations, because we have to kind of improv along the way. So I think the things that you said that were very interesting is the interplay between you, between culture and money is going to be a very interesting conversation if you're interested in social change because if you just think about money and you don't think about culture you're not going to get the behavior changes you want and if you just think about culture and you don't think about money you're not going to be able to fund the, the, the behavior changes are you speaking you from personal money. experience <laughs> yes exactly um, so you said let's not have artificial intelligence let's have anthropological intelligence so we're going to dig in to see what that, what, that, what that actually looks like. So I want to start by taking the lens of an anthropologist to a set of questions about how citizens behave, how consumers behave, and build that up through the course of this conversation to start thinking about a program for social change. And I'd like to start by your Japanese Kit Kat example which is in, uh, I think, chapter two in the book, which is insights into how consumers behave and how you sell products by looking at culture. And then let's begin to see what other lessons we can deduce from that. Well, thank you. Well, <clears throat> um, I do tell the story of Kit Kat in my book, which might sound a bit weird. Um, but it was actually driven by my desire to debunk something which people often think about when you talk about culture. Because people think that cultures, different cultures, are like boxes. They have neat edges, they're static, and they can be stacked up on each other with a sense of hierarchy of value. You know, my culture is better than your culture. And that's actually the way that a lot of 19th century anthropologists thought originally. Um, anthropology actually came from very, very dirty intellectual origins because it was really originally driven by a desire by imperialists in the 19th century to go around the world and study weird people, either because they wanted to control, convert, trade, or tax them, or because they'd been very heavily influenced by Charles Darwin. And in the same way you had physical evolution, they thought that you had social and cultural evolution. So they basically put cultures in boxes and put people who looked different from them down the bottom. And invariably, there were white men in the box at the top. Um, in fact, 20th century anthropology did a complete U-turn intellectually and went from basically being a pretty racist, sexist um, discipline into being a very anti-racist, anti-sexist discipline. Um, the Nazis burned anthropology books um, almost top of the pile when they did their book burnings. Um, and out of that flip came this idea that actually cultures don't exist as boxes. They're not fixed, they're constantly changing a bit, and they're more like rivers, which are flowing with new streams coming in. And you can't sit there and do a hierarchy, and you can't assume that they're fixed. And that point actually is incredibly liberating, because it means that we can all learn something from each other and blend. 
Now, to come back to chocolate and why this matters, and it sounds very disconnected, but Kit Kat started life as a British biscuit. Come from Roundtree, a company set up by a British Quaker in the late 19th century. Um, it was really marketed after World War II as a brown chocolate biscuit for British factory workers under the tag, have a break, have a Kit Kat. And then it was sold around the world as a British export. Turns up in Japan, by then Nestle, the Swiss company, has bought Roundtree, and they notice at the turn of the century, it's not selling very well, that for some weird reason, sales of Kit Kat spike at, at New Year. And they dig into it and they realize that in the southern island of Japan, Kyushu, a group of Japanese teenagers has started a fashion for buying each other Kit Kats at exam time because the word Kit Kat sounds like a Japanese phrase, kitokatsu, which means we shall overcome or go for it. And at that point, you could have been, you know, like a 19th century anthropologist and said, gosh, those weird Japanese, they're clearly inferior, they don't understand what a chocolate biscuit is, let's ignore it. But instead, Nestle said, you know what, let's try and lean into this. So they started marketing Kit Kat bars under this tag of Kitokatsu. And they lent into the idea that in Shinto religion in Japan, there's this idea of having prayer tokens for, for stressful moments. Within three years, half of all Japanese teenagers were giving each other Kit Kats at exam times as a, what they call an omamori, a kind of prayer token. And it was actually overtaking almost every other form of prayer token that Shinto priests were blessing. Then they lent in even more and started creating Kit Kats that were flavored with wasabi, soy sauce, it's all true, Hokkaido potatoes, no, Hokkaido cheese, purple sweet potato, um, you name it. And they had a rainbow color of Kit Kats. And then the Kit Kats became so outrageous that they began to be bought by tourists to Japan as Japanese souvenirs, not British souvenirs. And then the wheel comes full circle, and hands up who's seen a matcha Kit Kat in Britain. Who's tasted it? Yeah. So now they sell matcha tea, green tea Kit Kats back into Britain. And they're actually made in Germany, in the factory. <laughs> so the question now is, is Kit Kat today British, Swiss, Japanese, or German? It's all of it. And that shows how cultures are like rivers. And I just wish more politicians would act as if their own cultural identity was like a chocolate bar. <clears throat> so we're going, to f we're going to leave that out because we're going to come back to what this tells us about how we deal with climate change in a moment. But I'm now going to pivot into discussing Ebola in West Africa and the typical prism of public health officials, which is we're all rational economic actors. You explain to people what you need to do in order to protect yourself. Um, sound vaguely familiar in the, in the era of COVID. Um, and what you need to do to frame the adoption of practices which will in fact save you for, for, from a pandemic. So tell us a little bit about that and we'll layer that on to how we begin to kind of the quest to improve human behavior for beneficial outcomes. Well, if you go back to this sort of win-win scenario I explained about anthropology, that immersing yourself in the lines of others can give you empathy for difference and you can learn things. Um, you know, what happened with Ebola in 2014 is very instructive because it's directly relevant to what we got wrong with COVID. 2014, Ebola hits West Africa. Um, the West initially ignores it because it's kind of weirdo, people who live in strange places they can't pronounce. Um, and the international medical community comes into West Africa and tries to tell local West Africans how to deal with Ebola. And it is disastrous. The first six months, it kept spreading and spreading to a point that in August 2014, um, the World Health, so the CDC, about which we all know now, but the American CDC, predicted that 1.2 million people could die. And they couldn't understand why it wasn't working because they were throwing medical science and data science at it big time. They had computer models of what was happening. They had all the medical scientists there. And then they realized that what they'd missed was behavioral science. Because the way they were presenting the messages about Ebola 
were completely at odds with local culture, and the way that they were trying to fight Ebola directly ran into the face of local cultural traditions. Um, to give one example, you know, they kept building these um, centers to put people into um, for, and treat them with Ebola, and they had opaque walls. So the families of people who had gone to these centers didn't know where they'd gone, and they couldn't see them. And so naturally, they were terrified and didn't want them to go. Anyway, so they brought in finally some anthropologists, some local people to talk to people locally about what was going on. They actually started listening to locals, switched tack, tried to combine with behavioral science with medical science, computer science, and actually within about three or four months, they'd got the disease under control, and in the end, about 25,000 people died, not 1.2 million. Really good news story in many ways. Now, fast forward to the beginning of COVID, and it turns out that people who were in charge of the UK government's own COVID response included people who'd been at the heart of the British aid programmes in fighting Ebola and had actually written papers about the need to blend social, medical and behavioural science. Sorry, to blend computing, medical and behavioural science. So you would think that at that point, the British government would stand up and say, wow, why don't we try and learn some lessons from what's happened with Ebola? Or why don't we try and learn some lessons from what happened in Asia with things like SARS? Didn't happen. Neither the UK government nor the US government spent much time looking at what other countries had done in that respect. And this fundamental message about the need to blend computer, um, medical and social science was largely discarded because as everyone in the room knows, the opening weeks and months of the whole COVID saga were not a period when the messaging around COVID was consistent or particularly sympathetic or even culturally in tune with what people wanted to know. People in the UK didn't sit there and say, you know what, we have this amazing network of NHS medical centres. We have probably the best network of community centres anywhere in the Western world. Let's use that to get the messaging across. And said so it was top down. And it really was a story about missed opportunities. So again, one of the messages in my book is that if you try and learn from other cultures and other peoples, don't treat them as weird, and actually try and show them <coughs> respect and humility instead of hubris, you can often get a lot further. And one last thing I'll give you, one tiny example is, anthropologists had studied mask wearing in Asia in great detail before COVID. And they knew that the power of a mask doesn't just lie in the physical barrier it presents to germs. You know, it stops germs physically, but actually the ritual of putting on a mask prompts you to change behavior. It's quite important psychologically. And it's a cultural signal to show that you'll actually want to uphold the norms of the group and have responsibility for others. So the signaling and psychological impact is actually quite important for behavior change as well as the physical side. That lesson was written out in detail before COVID. Um, if only people had realized that earlier, maybe Boris Johnson wouldn't have been so careless with his mask wearing in the early months. There's an entire PhD thesis to go down this rabbit hole, but well, um, I will resist. Um, you have a section in the book which feels to me kind of apocryphal, but then the more I looked at it, it felt sort of it had a kind of genuine feel to it, which was about what anthropology taught you specifically about the 2007-2008 financial crisis and the predictive power that a different discipline gives you in anticipating something that perhaps those people trained in a, a more narrow formal economics training would perhaps miss. So tell us about that. Well, very briefly, because I know I've spoken at too much length, but um, this story really starts in 2005 when I went down to Nice to the European Securitization Forum's annual meeting, which is full of financiers who at the time were doing securitization and CDO, CDS, all these financial products. Um, and I walked into that hall and I thought, wow, I'm back at a Tajik wedding. Because actually, investment banking conferences, in many ways, are very similar to Tajik weddings. In the sense that what both of these gigantic rituals do is pull together a scattered tribe, put them into a small space where they enact rituals, you know, in Tajikistan dancing, 
at an investment banking conference, sort of PowerPoints and drinking around the bar. You recreate social ties, and most importantly, you reflect and recreate a shared worldview with social silences. And so I sat down in this hall surrounded by all these investment bankers engaged in their gigantic ritualistic fest. And I looked at the PowerPoints and what they were doing, and I thought, wow, there's a whole bunch of things that their rituals are signaling. Um, one of them was that they were essentially a tribe set apart. They had a very strong sense of their own tribal identity. They were all members of the Bloomberg village, which is basically a group of people who can talk to each other by membership of Bloomberg email group. They all have the same sense of history, defined by a Bloomberg chart, with 10 years of history on every chart. Um, they all have the same news feed. But this particular group, the Securitization Tribe, had a very strong sense that they were pretty elite because they spoke the financial equivalent of Latin, um, basically CDO jargon that no one else understood, and that gave them power. So they were set apart. They had a very strong sense of their creation mythology, which every professional tribe has a creation myth. And their creation mythology was all about the cult of liquefaction. And by that I mean that they passionately believed that if only they could create perfectly liquid markets for everything, where everything could be traded, the world would be, would be wonderful. And there were numerous holes and contradictions in that theory, like the fact that they were creating all these new products called CDOs, which were supposed to be all about creating perfect free markets in a mark-to-market -market financial accounting system, but they were so damn compli complicated that no one could actually trade them. So you had to use rating agency models to get prices. If, I mean, I don't know if there are many financiers in the audience, but if there are, you know what I mean. Um, they said that they were doing this whole exercise to spread risk and make the system less risky, and the techniques to spread risk were actually introducing new risks and making it more risky. But they had this whole theory about you know, what they were doing and creation mythology that they believed. But the other point was that they actually kept saying we're doing this to help people, and it's to make it easier for people to borrow money. And all their PowerPoints had only pictures of equations and Greek letters, and there were no faces. And I realized that they regarded finance as a kind of abstract physics experiment that had become very detached from real life in their own perception of it. And there's a wonderful scene, if any of you have seen in that movie um, based on Michael Lewis's book, The Big Short, where the hedge fund traders go down and meet a pole dancer in Florida and realize she has a subprime mortgage or several subprime mortgages. And they kind of go, holy shit, you're doing that? And what's amazing about it was not that they were surprised by what she was doing, it was the fact that so few financiers in that time were actually seeing the end point of their financial chains. So I sort of came back from that conference and said, well, this is really fascinating technology and very exciting innovation, but it's basically in the hands of a small group who are facing almost no external scrutiny. Their own bosses have no idea what they're up to. Um, and there are very few controls on what they're doing, and it's kind of detached from wider society. There's no reason why it wouldn't spin out of control. Um, and that really set me on a path of trying to, you know, look into what was going wrong, and eventually, you know, I sort of wrote all these pieces saying that a crisis is coming. Um, but it really came down to tragic wedding rituals and how they're linked to investment bankers. <laughs> Finally and by the way, I should say, I, I still feel passionately, all of you, if you go to professional conferences in your day job, um, well, when you go to professional conferences next after COVID in your day job, um, have a look around and think about the cultural messages that are embedded in what you're doing. And then think about what is not being talked about, the social silences, because that's often more important than what is talked about. We we're about to do that. But the other thing is try and get invited to a tragic wedding. That's, that's, <laughs> that seems to me to be a, a, a takeaway from your book. Um, okay, so social silences, um, the fourth and last of the anecdotes before we're going to kind of move into problem solving. Um, you, talk, you talk about in the book about it's not so much the data we get and the observations that we acquire by looking at things. It's the data that we don't get, the silences that we miss, and the data points that are hidden, but which actually reveal greater truths that tell us a much more. And so I guess 
I'd like to hear from you a few of those anecdotes, but why you think in particular anthropology draws you to hidden data and silences in ways that other disciplines don't. Well, one of the things that anthropologists believe is you have to try and take a connected, holistic view of the world. You look at the world bottom up, you get a worm's eye view, not a, top down, not a bird's eye view. Um, and you try and spend a, much t a lot of time thinking about what people don't talk about, not what they do talk about. So it's the things that weren't on the PowerPoints in the banker's presentation that was interesting. Um, or to use a completely different example, um, teenagers and their cell phone usage. There's a wonderful um, anthropologist called Dana Boyd in New York who's worked for a lot of tech companies who did a study a few years ago on why teenagers are addicted to their cell phones, which is you know, an issue we're all grappling with if you have teenagers. And most studies look at this in terms of the teenager and the cell phone and the algorithms and the technology and within the framework of tech. What she did was say, OK, let's look at teenagers in their everyday lives and their physical experiences. And what she noticed was that if you look at teenagers in middle class suburban America today, and track it over 100 years. 100 years ago, most teenagers could physically move around the world with a lot of freedom. This is pre-COVID. Um, and you know, even 50 years ago or 30 years ago, they were cycling to school. They were meeting down the back of the bike sheds. They were walking around the streets. They were bumping into each other without parental supervision and control. Parents didn't know where they were. You fast forward to the modern era, and teenagers are so overscheduled and their parents are so terrified of stranger danger, and if they live in the suburbs, they're so dependent on cars, that they're physically con constrained and controlled to a point where the only place they can really roam without parents breathing down their necks easily, or congregate online with their friends, or collide with the unexpected, is online. So why are we surprised that teenagers go online all the time? Because that is where they are freer today and the point is, if you want to understand that, you can't understand it just by looking at teenagers and their cell phones. That's the noise. You have to look at the silence, which is the physical world people don't pay attention to. And, you know, I can go on for ages about that, but that pattern plays out over and over and over again in almost every area of life and almost every business, er business problem that you want to solve. Another completely different example, um, there's a whole section in my book about General Motors, which hired an anthropologist to go and work out why things kept going so badly wrong inside General Motors. And one of the things she did was to try and work out why the unions kept fighting with the management. And she realised that, you know, she realised, in fact, the union workers were hiding parts on the assembly line in their lockers because the system for making cars was so insane and the demands on them were so contradictory that the only way they could cope with it was to hide the parts in their lockers to actually meet their quotas. Again, that was invisible to the managers because that wasn't what on their minds when they were thinking about why are the unions behaving weirdly. She also pointed out that they, they had a wonderful merger at one stage between a German car maker and um, a Detroit-based car maker and a Tennessee-based car maker, which went horribly badly wrong. And they kept calling meetings to work out why it was going wrong. And they thought the problems were to do with the design of the car or language, German versus English. And then she worked out it was because the three different groups started off with different assumptions about what the whole point of a meeting was to begin with. So one group thought that a meeting was to rubber stamp decisions. One group thought a meeting was to create a consensus. And another group thought that a meeting was basically you know, where you brainstormed ideas and they all came into it with different ideas, but no one had ever bothered to talk about the silence, which was, what is a meeting in the first place? Um, so, you know, thinking about social silences, I would argue, is key. OK, so <clears throat> about two weeks ago, I had a conversation on the stage with Jeremy Oppenheim, uh, co-founder of Systemic, setting out what was partly optimistic but partly bleak our prospects for getting to net zero by 2050 and therefore what we need to do which is roughly halve emissions by 2030. And the rough summary of that conversation of relevance to the conversation we're having now is we know the path, we know the sectors, we know the finance, 
we have the technology or it's sufficiently proximate to be reasonably confident in each of these sectors, we are able to reduce carbon emissions by half by 2030. The challenge is really political slash cultural. And the greatest indication of that is if you look at the declarations that governments have made prior to going to COP, which is about to happen, we need to be collectively reducing by 50%. You take them at their word, we're going to be 16% above current emissions by 2030. If you pause and think of that empirically, that puts us in a three plus degree world, which means large parts of this planet are uninhabitable. It's unimaginable and a tipping point is on the way. Now, if you pause and think of that intellectually, you would say if we're all rational actors, we should be banging it out, carbon reducing every second of the day and economically every penny, cent, yen, euro that we put in to carbon reduction right now has an almost, almost infinite return because civilizations on the other side of it and also there's lots of good economic arguments to say what we're investing now would be good return but we're failing to do so and I think that what I'm interested in hearing from you is if you think about it anthropologically for a moment we we're biologically as a species used to things that are coming at us fast on a plane that's a saber-toothed tiger where the risk is immediate and is going to kill us and we're terrible as a species at thinking of risks that are just over the hill which are way more deadly than the tiger, but are going to get us when it's too late. And so what we have to spend all our time thinking about, and what I want to use the remainder of our time thinking about, is through the <coughs> lens of an anthropologist thinking about culture and human behavior, what should we be doing to reshape and reformulate the quest for net zero in terms that are likely to cause us to change? Because the rational economic model ain't working and it has to in civilizational t terms work. So we need different disciplines and different ways of thinking to be brought to bear. And I think that's a really interesting conversation to have because I think your book sets us up to think about things in a, through a different discipline that might be more productive than the more rational discipline that thus far is seeming to fail to produce the solutions that are required. Well, thank you. It's an issue I spent a lot of time thinking about because one of the things I've done in the FT recently um, was about two and a half years ago, I co-founded a platform called Moral Money, which basically is a sort of newsletter looking at environmental social governance issues. Um, I tell the story in my book about why I did that. Um, it wasn't initially a very easy thing to do, but, um, you know, it very much came out of my anthropology sort of, you know, training. Um, I'm going to give a very quick shout out, by the way, to Simon, who, Simon Mundy, just over there, who's my colleague from the FT, who as of about four days ago, came in as a new editor of Moral Money. Um, so you can blame him in the future if you don't like it. Um, but he also has a book I'm going to very quickly mention, which I think he's going to talk about, about climate change and business and innovation that's coming out in two weeks' time, called Race for Tomorrow. So you can grab him afterwards and talk to him about it. But so I've spent a lot of time thinking about ESG. Um, and I've got good news and bad news. The good news is I think ESG is fascinating because I think what ESG has come out of is a recognition that in the late 20th century we created a whole suite of intellectual tools that you'd call rational to look at the world, navigate the world, which were fundamentally bounded. And by that I mean that people created economic models which were defined by what you put into the model. That was your rational economic model. You created balance sheets that were defined by profit and losses, big data sets, and everything else outside it was kind of ignored. And the problem with that is that your, that model, that compass, that you know, ba balance sheet is really useful if the stuff outside that model or compass isn't changing. But if it is, you're in trouble. It's a bit like the image I use in my book is someone walking through a dark wood at night with a compass. You don't want to throw away your compass but if you walk through that wood and just look down at your compass the whole time and just keep your fixed eyes fixed on it, no matter how brilliant it is, you're going to walk into a tree. You have to basically look up and look around. And the environmental issues, most of the ESG issues, were previously in the territory of what was outside the models, off the balance sheet. There were footnotes to the balance sheet. 
They were outside the stuff you collected in your big data sets. And what has happened in the 21st century is I think people have begun to realize, and they can't articulate it, that that externality stuff matters. It's tripping up our models. We live in an unstable world where things are changing very fast, where the climate is mattering, where political instability is mattering, inequality, racism, all that stuff outside the model is mattering. So ESG, in many ways, is all about moving from tunnel vision to lateral vision, or dare I say it, anthrovision. And that's the good news. So I think people recognize that and are grasping towards that. And I think the very fact you're saying, how do we move beyond rational models to actually bringing in other perspectives and think about this holistically is really important. The other bit of good news is that climate change, sorry, COVID in many ways has parallels for the climate change problems because it's basically a shock that has, one, shown us that we live in an interconnected world whether we like it or not. And that although we don't understand each other, we're exposed to each other and we need to have some empathy. Two, it's shown us that we cannot ignore hard science, however much we'd like to. Three, it's shown us so that we also need behavioral science. And this really comes into your point. Because as we saw with COVID, you can't fix a pandemic just with medical science or data science. Because if you can't persuade people to get vaccinated, damn it, and I live in New York, you have problems. Same thing with climate change. Unless you find a way to think about the incentives and the messaging, and if you find a way to actually understand the holistic picture of what's going on, it's going to be very, very hard to get the behavioural change that you need to accompany any policy shift or even corporate pledges, etc., etc. And that part is very hard. There are examples we can look at to think about for encouragement. Um, to my mind, the day that the financial crisis changed a bit was in August 2007 when at Jackson Hole, somebody from PIMCO stood up and uttered the word shadow bank. And I say that mattered because I'd spent the previous two years trying very hard at the FT to draw attention to what was happening in the bowels of finance, where everything was covered in acronyms. And the best way to hide anything in the modern world is to cover it in acronyms, because everyone then ignores it and it's hidden in plain sight. And I couldn't get stories about CDOs or CDO of ABS or anything like that on the front page of the FT. But the minute someone said shadow bank, I had a sexy way to explain it because it sounded faintly scary. Stranded asset has a similar kind of resonance. Suddenly, with a phrase, you actually communicate what's going on on the balance sheet of investors and big oil companies. But we need to do that a thousand times over. And it can't just be Greta Thunberg putting the fear of God into all these middle-aged men. We need to find ways to communicate the gravity of what's going on when it's wrapped up with acronyms and technical language and all of that. So I want to come to a, a question about sacrifice because I suspect that until we begin to embrace some notion of sacrifice, we won't get to where we need to get. And in one way, COVID is a very helpful example of this. We've spent between, depending on whose accounting model you believe, between 10, maybe up to $15 trillion in debt rapidly in responding to COVID over an incredibly short period of time. When everybody thought debt is this terrible thing, suddenly we had absolutely no compunction to do so. And we also voluntarily imprisoned ourselves in our own homes and agreed to a whole set of restrictions on our liberty without really having to put guns to our heads. We did so voluntarily. And we did so because people close to us were dying mm -hmm. or we saw or we feared that they might when they actually weren't. So human beings through COVID had an ability. We've demonstrated. We have a real life case study right now that we, we demonstrated the capacity to sacrifice when we face what we think is an existential threat. We haven't translated that notion of sacrifice into the climate movement. And I think and I suspect that people who spend time getting up alongside other cultures, we, all cultures, 
have a sacrifice model. We sacrifice for our children more than anything that you can imagine. And we, we sacrifice for the future all the time. So how do we make sacrifice for the future through the prism of climate, what we've just done for COVID? Because I suspect that's going to be necessary. Well, one of the things we learned in the COVID experience is that human beings have very warped views of risk. Um, something that happens in pandemics throughout history is xenophobia. It almost always happens. And xenophobia goes hand in hand with this idea that pollution, threats from outside are very dangerous. And human beings tend to overestimate the risk of pollution and external threats and underestimate their domestic internal threats. Um, there's a wonderful anthropologist called Mary Douglas who's written about this a lot. Um, the ultimate expression of that was Donald Trump, who spent all his time talking about the Chinese invasion of COVID and was terrified of Chinese invasion, outsiders, and was so lax about his own domestic situation that they had an outbreak of COVID inside the White House. That's an extreme example of what tends to happen. So human beings are very bad at judging risk, point one. But the other message from um, the COVID experience was that actually, to go back to the Kit Kat story, culture is not set in stone, it changes. We're all hardwired to assume that the way we live and the cultural assumptions we have are natural, inevitable and permanent. They never are. And just think about the fact that when COVID-19 started in New York, I assumed that we would never ever have New Yorkers wearing masks individualistic culture, masks were laden with stigma, they were thought to be Asian things, and guess what? They're now New York things. They're very much out and about. Culture's changed, so behavior can change. Um, and the other thing from COVID is that we've all had right now the equivalent of what is a gigantic anthropologic experience, i.e. culture shock. You know, anthropology is a discipline dedicated to embracing culture shock as a good thing. And recognizing that a bit of culture shock jolts you out of the familiar and enables you to rethink the world. And every single person has experienced that because we've all been forced to go back to our homes and be forced to think about the rituals in our lives, our social group, who's gonna be in our Zoom pod, who's not, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's scary, but it also gives opportunity. And it's possible that we'll just stumble back into our old ways but it also creates an opportunity to actually think actively about what we want. So do people get political brownie points by talking about shared sacrifice? No. But are we going to have to find ways to try and communicate what the stakes are and how we need to change our collective behaviour? Absolutely yes. So that's a perfect tee to the next question, which is about, you've said it multiple times and your anecdotes and your stories have vividly illustrated the point about that culture is permeable, it moves, it's capable of being shaped. And almost always it is shaped by power and by authority. It can be state power, it can be corporate power, it can be soft power, but culture doesn't just change spontaneously, it is moved. So the world we live in now is one in which power and where power resides, and anthropologists always look at this uh, in their discipline, is shifting. Mm -hmm. So we used to have it in largely kings or in gods or in states or in corporations or in the media or our churches. And we live in a world where that power is being redistributed, devalued, jeopardized uh, almost all the time. And so pointing out who bears credible authority to reshape culture is a more complicated question because the institutions we all used to trust, we've lost a lot of trust in them. So where is the power and the authority going to come from, and it's deeply relevant to everybody who's a member of the conduit, to reshape culture in ways that it needs to be reshaped in order for us to rise to the challenges that we need to rise to? Well, it's a really interesting question because when I was an anthropologist at you know, Cambridge, we used to be told that there were two ways to create trust that glued societies together. If they were small, you had face-to-face -face trust, and you had what was called horizontal patterns of trust where everyone kind of knew everyone else and trusted each other. And when societies got big, you had vertical pa patterns of trust where you trusted in a king 
or a company or an institution, etc. So horizontal or vertical. 21st century has created a third type of trust, which is horizontal trust on a massive scale, what they call distributed trust. Because technology now enables you to trust a crowd in a really large way, um, in a way we never imagined before. So yes, people no longer trust politicians, but they trust Uber drivers. They trust Airbnb. How? Because actually mechanisms have been created on digital platforms to build trust through the crowd, through verifying, giving each other points, etc. People don't look to Zagat's, a vertical expert anymore, when they want to decide where to go for a meal. They go to online ratings and look at the crowd. In almost every area, we're moving from a situation where we had trust in authority figures, vertical, to horizontal on a massive scale. And that is, in some ways, amazingly empowering and egalitarian. It's also chaotic. In a world where we tend to be very fractured and tribal online, and when we go from our home life into digital space, or when we go into real world into cyberspace, we take our tribalism with us and intensify it because our online experience is all about customization. Um, you know, we live in generation C where we can all customize everything. Um, you know, the same idea we have with our own musical playlist. We don't accept someone else's selection on a vinyl record or cassette. We don't accept listening to the radio on someone else's schedule for when we want to listen to music. We want our own playlist today. 21st century is all about our own playlist. And we take that pick and mix playlist sort of metaphor into our online identities and our social groups. And doing that in a world where we're looking for horizontal trust as sources of information creates these gr cliquey groups and creates a kind of fracture and the tribalism and silos we see which creates such a fragmented political culture. Um, and that's very dangerous. But it's also liberating and exciting. And the question that's going to face all of us in the next decade as we try and think about how do we grapple with these big problems is not just how do we get governments to do stuff, um, but how do we actually activate that online crowd? So my final question is going to be, and it draws on, it draws ex on exactly this point, which is, I want to put to you an idea and see where you see the kind of anthropological application of it, and that is asymmetry for good. And by that I mean, previously when we've had asymmetries, terrorists, small groups of people can hijack a plane, fly it into the World, world Trade Center and the world changes. Um, kings are asymmetrically bad. Small groups of people having, wielding enormous oligarchs are asymmetrically bad. But where do we find our own asymmetries of good? I think it's called Greta Thunberg. Well, so exactly. <laughs> if one so, teenager can basically right. terrify so many CEOs, they, they all have to go out and do something. So, so I think one of the things that I think is interesting to think about is, is it Greta Thunberg, is it the streets is Extinction Rebellion, is it share action and engine number one changing ExxonMobil by getting people on its board, is it client earth suing the German government, getting the Paris Agreement, into the German constitution and causing the new government to have to rewrite its energy laws. Client, client Earth, 20 million pound organization, Extinction Rebellion, a couple hundred people popping up in different places at different moments, grabbing our attention disproportionately, Scandinavian teenagers, small hedge funds taking positions on boards and changing the forces of, of corporate behemoths. And so I think one of the things to think about is where do we find those asymmetries that work in our favor that aren't always working in people who don't have an interest in the collective good? And might that give us some hints or clues about what we collectively as a community could be doing? Well, I think right now you need both. Um, I think, and this is, well, I won't give you a lecture about climate change, but briefly, you need catalysts like Greta Thunberg, but you also need coordination. Um, because you are at a very interesting moment in, right now in terms of the climate change debate and sustainability debate for two reasons. Firstly, that if you, if you dial back five years, governments were being asked to lead the fight against climate change. 
What's actually happened since then is that in many ways, civil society and companies and finance have generated a sort of level of energy that in some ways is pushing the debate forward, almost ahead of government sometimes. And what's needed today, though, is actually not so much governments to lead, but governments to follow, to nudge, to coordinate, to recognize where you have big market failures, and to be intelligent and proactive and act. So, for example, what everyone's living with right now is the fact that you know wind turbines are a fabulous thing, but they haven't been um, designed to basically you know, fill in for the decline in fossil fuel production for energy sources. That was pretty obvious a year ago, and it required something other than relying on markets to jump in. You know, I could go on and on about that. The other interesting thing, though, which I am fascinated by because of our moral money coverage, um, is that originally ESG and climate change activism was really driven by a small group of social activists and companies and financial groups who wanted to actively change the world. You know, they were mostly Danish pension funds, um, you know, some charities, etc., etc. Now, many of the people getting involved are not so much trying to change the world or do no harm to the world, they're trying to do no harm to themselves. Because ESG has actually become, as much as anything, a tool of risk management and self-defense. Because companies and corporate leaders and financiers are trying to protect themselves from reputational risks, the risk of losing their employees, their investors, their customers, the, fact, the risk of you know, having regulatory problems, etc. And you can sit there and say, you know what, that makes the whole thing total BS. It's hypo hip hypocritical. Um, it's all about greenwashing. Or you can say, you know what, it's a sign that the zeitgeist has changed. Because when I started off my career covering real life revolutions in the Soviet Union, what I quickly realized was that revolutions succeed not when a tiny minority of activists shout, but when the silent majority decide it's riskier to oppose something than to go along. And that has been the tipping point for ESG in the corporate world in the last few years. That actually, the fact that corporate boards are saying, we better have a strategy because if we don't, we're going to kind of look stupid, or we're going to get Greta Thunberg yelling at us, or my teenage kids who like Greta Thunberg will be yelling at me at home. The fact they're doing it out of that shows how zeitgeist can shift. So to go back to where I'm starting, it's fantastic that culture can change. Therein lies an amazing opportunity for us all. It's happened within our own living memory. We can't remember what the zeitgeist was like 15 years ago when CEOs weren't talking about this stuff. It is not sufficient as an answer, but by golly, we can celebrate it. And somehow we have to harness that, bring together the catalyst and the coordinators, and actually try and get some real change in the coming years. Absolutely fascinating. I think a round of applause is due. So we're going to save some time for some questions. I'm sure there'll be absolutely none. No hands will go up. I'm sure you're gagging for a drink by now. Yeah, exactly. We, yeah, we, I don't, we don't want to come between you and a drink, but Rupert. Oh, thank you both. Fantastic. Um, I'm interested in uh, tribes and technology. So um, as an anthropologist, do organizations like Facebook empower and enable empathy, or do they amplify and aggregate division? Um, short answer, they could empower empathy, but they mostly don't. And the reason is less to do with Facebook as to do with us. Because, you know, we're all tribal. I use the word tribal very loosely. We're all tribal in our real lives. We all cling to people we like and know. Um, the lockdown has made us even more tribal because we've been physically locked down in one spot with people exactly like us for the most part. Um, when we go online, we take our human nature with us. But because of this customization issue, and I cannot stress how important customization is, we tend to replicate and intensify our tribal instincts. Um, you know, if you go back, most cultures in the world regard the human being as being something that fits into the rest of the world. We're a derivative of society. 20th century, we had the me generation who thought that we were at the center and the world revolved us. 21st century, we all think we live in our own version of the matrix. 
and can fashion the world to what we want on a playlist culture approach. Um, and so we go online and we all basically, in a playlist way, choose our new sources, choose our friend groups and choose our identities and we can pick and mix our identities endlessly. Um, are there ways to counter that? Absolutely yes. All of these technology algorithms basically reinforce our worst instincts because as you all know, I hope you all read the filter bubble and things like that, they're all designed to actually re-entrench our tendency to be sort of customizing ourselves. Um, you could change those algorithms, you could make people collide with the unexpected, but you can also educate people much more than we do. And something I wish would happen is that just as we teach kids at school that they have to be concerned with cyber hygiene, cyber bullying, cyber hacking, we should be telling them upfront about cyber tribalism and say that every single algorithm out there is going to encourage you to become more tribal, not less, is deadly, and here are some ways to counter it, like step back and look at who you follow online and ask yourself if you've ever plunged yourself online into a completely different world and discussion. Um, think about your news sources. Try to mix it up, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, yes, it's partly Facebook's fault, but not just Facebook's fault. Over here. Um, thank you so much. Really a fascinating um, talk. Jim, I'm really curious about how you might think about how can we recreate the anthropologist experience when you haven't had it. I work with a number of companies off Facebook. It seems I've lived in none of these countries, Myanmar, and Asia, <coughs> when things happen and then they just don't relate to it, they don't have the empathy that kicks in. And mm -hmm. I try you know, as best I can to really help them connect with the people and not just the businesses they have to divest from. How can we do it for the future in terms of climate change? We need to be empathetic to the future generations. And what can we learn from the experiences today of recreating that anthropological experience overseas um, that we can maybe use in terms of viewing it from people's perspective in the future? It's a really great question. And, you know, COVID-19 and lockdown has in many ways made it harder because we've been physically locked down. Um, one of the things I think is very sad is that, you know, many teenage kids I know including my own, haven't been out traveling, haven't been thrown into different worlds. Um, there's a culture of fear and a culture of clinging to our own ourselves that we know, the familiar, which I think is in danger of taking hold. Um, how would we go about doing it? Well, I'm a huge believer in packing kids off as much as we can in the coming years to travel, if we possibly can. I'm a huge believer in trying to physically travel ourselves. I'm also a huge believer in just trying to look at what's beneath our noses and go talk to people who are different from us, go travel a different way to work, go try and put yourself into different communities. But also, you can use the online experience to actively seek out different ways of living and being and thinking online. And most of us don't, for reasons that are quite understandable. You know, it's kind of scary to plunge yourself into a chat room with people who are completely different from you, um, or start following people who are completely different from you. I went from a week a few years ago where I signed up to all the right-wing um, people tweeting that I could find, because I wanted to really get inside the mind of Breitbart and 8chan and 4chan and things like that. And, you know, it was really instructive. It showed me how little I knew. Um, I don't do it nearly as much as I should do. Um, but the other thing you can do is try, inside a company context, to actually take the senior leaders and managers out of their cosy C-suite existence and give them a taste of what it's like to be somewhere else. And it's not quite like the king walking amongst the peasants kind of thing, but you know, you can actually you know, take them on, go tell them to work for a week on the shop floor, go tell them to work, work for a week you know, in one of their shops, or to be a customer, or just see the world through other people's eyes. And when you look at what's gone wrong in Wall Street in recent years, or in Silicon Valley, it's almost always because people inside the citadel had very little sense of how they were perceived outside and how their actions were misread by others. You can also just hire an anthropologist as well. I'm a sort of one-woman job creation scheme for anthropologists right now. We're going to do two, two final, because I'm getting the evil eye. But yep. And then I'm going to. Uh, hi, thanks very much for the talk. I have a question. When you wrote the book, um, 
how did you say to bring the message across um, to the CEOs, etc., who increasingly just emphasize data analytics and big data to make every decision? And your book is story-based, case-based, and anthropology mm. that approach. So how do you bring that communication across? Well, one of the things I discovered recently when I gave a speech to an AI conference is that um, AI platforms have done almost everything these days that you could imagine. You know, they scan financial data, medical data, they play Go, etc. There's one thing that no AI platform has ever done well, which is to tell a really good joke. And the reason is that artificial intelligence basically works by hoovering up big data or data in big data sets. Um, and looking for correlations, um, very roughly speaking. And the problem with correlation is that it's not causation. And the problem about taking a snapshot of the very, very recent past or near present through massive data sets is that you project that that will be the same in the future. It often is, but not always. And another problem is if you're hoovering up data, you don't really have that you know, idea of sense making, of interpretation. And you can't really read culture because the amazing thing about our cultures is that they're contradictory. We have layers of contradictory meanings all around us that we live with, ambiguities, which you can't literally just you know, boil down to an algorithm. And the other great thing about our cultures is that silence matters. Um, and in fact, if you think about jokes, the reason why jokes are funny is partly because they define a tribe you have to be in a group to get a joke. If you're not, you don't get the joke. That's kind of hard to measure. But also, jokes tend to work because they play off those layers of contradiction and silences. So all of those reasons means it's kind of hard for AI machines to make up jokes that are really funny, which is great, by the way. It means that comedians have job security. Um, but that kind of also points to the, you know, the issue that AI is an amazing tool. But there are some things AI can't do. And it's really to do with being human. And in addition to that, you know, AI has to be set in the human context to be managed, understood, to keep it ethical and safe. And we have to think about the culture of people who are creating AI as well. So when I face with you know, CEOs who are in love with AI tools and digital tools, you know, I try, try and tell them that example and then say, what about the silences? What about the contradictions? What about the social groups? And I say one more thing, which is this. Anyone know where the roots of the word company come from? Who hasn't read the book? It actually comes from old Italian, meaning con panio, with bread. Because companies started life as people who ate together. And that's a glorious celebration of the fact that actually we're human. And it's not just about balance sheets. Final question. Hey, thank you. Um, I have a question about politics and how to get elected. I was I was coming as minister in Tunisia after the Arab Spring, and then I have like two hearts in my chest. This is a German saying, uh, which is on one side I tell young people the best act to volunteer is to run for office, but on the other side I personally left politics because I felt I couldn't win by being integer, you know, by being ethical. You, saw, you talked about this generation of me, 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 like, you know, playlist. But there's also a generation of everything has to happen yesterday. Mm. And um, so I find it's a big tension for me personally, and also when I mentor other people who enter politics. How do you get elected if you have this answer of vision approach to life and with empathy and putting yourself in the shoes of others? Well, if I had that answer, I'd probably be a politician now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I salute what you've done. I really do. I genuinely think that having the courage to run for office is one of the most noble things you can do. Um, you know, it involves a lot of compromise. Unfortunately, a lot of getting things done in life does involve compromise. Um, I also have a lot of empathy for your decision to leave, because the compromise has often become too much. Um, you know, I hope that trying to tap into people's sense of empathy, communicate with them, um, trying to tap into a sense of wider shared values and you know vision but also recognizing that people are tribal and simply accepting that and trying to find ways to communicate with people through using those tribal cues recognizing that symbols and rituals matter 
I hope that can help inform politics. Um, one of the reasons why Donald Trump was such an effective politician in some ways was because he recognized that communication is not just about words, it's about performance. And he tapped into a performative style which w resonated with part of the electorate and completely baffled the other part. Um, I, again, I write about this in the book and how he borrowed the, the performative approach of wrestling for his political campaign, which people who were elite didn't understand, but many voters did instinctively. Um, so actually realizing all of those points is you know, really important. And the last point I'll make is that one of the other messages of, of anthropology is recognizing that just because you think a certain way, you can't assume that everyone else does too. Um, you know, media in 2016 made that mistake with Donald Trump because they thought that because they thought in a certain epistemological style <coughs> that this was the way the world worked, that everyone else must too, and they misread Donald Trump's appeal because of that. But conversely, to be a good politician today, you need to recognize that just the way that you think can be different from others and have the ability to listen and be surprised. So there are two things I love about uh, our new home. The one is that you get to play out with Pineapple Studios uh, rocking through the wall while Julian Tett talks about anthropology. Um, and the second is that you guys show up. Uh, and that we're able to have thoughtful, deep, interesting conversations about how to make the world more sustainable and more just. And there's a high probability that people in this room will continue to do so. So thank you to you for being here. Julian will sign books in the back, but I encourage you to go to the third floor because it's <coughs> cool and groovy and there's good cocktails. And um, we'll continue seeing you again um, in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you. <laughs>